lines after it you needed to kind of you know convert the structure into a citizen state but you could never do that um, you had uh, dictatorships in pakistan <coughs> and my colleagues to the second session of 6th International Islam and Liberty Conference on second day. The theme is Building an Islamic Case for Open Markets. In the second session, we aim at presenting and exploring lessons from history. The chair uh, of the session is a historian and senior researcher at Asian History and Society Institute of Humboldt University of Berlin. Please welcome Professor Dr. Bettina Robotka. The first speaker of the session is Mr. Reza Nehi, a PhD scholar at University of Arkansas, Faithful USA. Mr. Nehi will enlighten us about the concept of welfare society in Islam and the patterns of the thought presented by Sufi Shahina Shahid almost three centuries ago. So please welcome Mr. Reza Nehi. The second speaker of session at hand is Dr. Humaira Shahid, an author of Devotion Defiance in Pakistan. Dr. Shahid will discuss about eliminating Vibha and uh, by exploring and constructing an alternative model to substitute it into the financial markets. Now I will finally hand over the session to the chair for the start of discussions and deliberations. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having us here, and uh, I think we are so late, we should go just ahead. Please, Raza Naim, your paper. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers, uh, especially Dr. Husna Lameen, our, my old benefactor and friend and mentor, as my old friend also, uh, Ali Salman, uh, for uh, you know selecting my abstract and paper and making it possible for me to to come here and present my research. Uh, this paper is actually a work in progress. Uh, although I will welcome your comments, criticisms, and suggestions, uh, it's part of a book which I am writing uh, on the pioneers of Islamic socialism in the Indian subcontinent. And uh, one of the big chapters is on uh, Sufi Shah and Ayat Shaheed. Uh, now, when I uh, looked at the call for papers, I immediately wanted to disagree with the theme. I wanted to dissent from the theme. So I sent my paper. And obviously, I was not expecting to be selected because the, the, paper, the, the conference theme vehemently called for Islamic capitalism, Islamic economics. And here I was arguing that perhaps what we need is not a return to Islamic capitalism, not a return to Islamic uh, economics, but a return to Islamic socialism. And there's a very fertile tradition of Islamic socialism in the Muslim world, you know, from, uh, from Jam Gamal Abdul Nasser in Egypt to, uh, to Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto right here in this country, to Dr. Ali Shariati in Iran, and uh, you know, Indonesia, uh, all over the world. And this is as much a good time to draw talk about Islamic socialism as socialism proper because, uh, you know, uh, because of the world financial crisis, uh, you know, Karl Marx is being mentioned again, uh, you know. This is the 200th year of his birth. Uh, and also it is the 300th anniversary of the martyrdom of Shaina, Sufi Shaina at Shaheed. So I bring to you the story and the idea of this socialist Sufi uh, who of the Indus Valley, who right here where we stand in this, uh, in this, uh, you know, Indus Valley civilization, we are the inheritors of that great civilization. Uh, you know, he was the precursor of Islamic socialism in the Indian subcontinent. Next, please. Can you move the slide, please? Thank you. So, uh, my paper uh, takes issue with the theme of, uh, of uh, you know, this, uh, you know, Islamic capitalism and Islamic economics. Uh, 
Sufi Shahinaj Shaheed uh, and his movement symbolized social justice, civil liberties, and radical democracy at a crucial time in the Indian subcontinent. We talked about the Mughal Empire briefly yesterday. Uh, when the Mughal Empire was crumbling and such values were non-existent, in that the majority of the Sufis of Sindh had abandoned the preaching and practice of social justice and had become purely worldly landlords. So his slogan was, Jeko Khere Sokhai, he who tills the land has the right to eat. Next, please. And he was saying this a full 100 years before the birth of Karl Marx, 150 years before the advent of the Paris Commune, uh, 200 years before the advent of the Sindhi Hari Tariq, meaning the, the movement of the Sindhi peasants, and 250 years before the advent of Zulfikar Ali Bhutto. Uh, Shah Inayat and his movement symbolized the principles of radical democracy and social justice in practice, which became a threat to the ruling Kalhora ruler when it successfully set up an agricultural commune in Jok and began to spread among many districts of Lower Sindh. Despite the fact that Shah Inayat had tried to make collective farming, i.e. the socialist method of production and distribution, a custom in the era of feudalism, which was far ahead of its time, the experiment ended in defeat. Next, please. So my paper is based on original research and original translations of Persian accounts of the period since the official language before the arrival of the British was Persian, uh, you know, and that changed after 1857 when the British replaced it with English. The paper explores the singular achievements of Shah Inayat Shaheed and his movement in fostering a successful example of social justice and radical democracy and evaluates the causes of its success and failure. Next, please. The year of the birth of Shah Inayat is unknown, but this much can be said with certainty that he was born in a God-fearing family of Thatta in the 17th century during the period of Emperor Aurangzeb Alamgir. He belonged to the Qadriya uh, Silsila. Uh, he had not migrated from Iran or Turan, but had emerged from this very soil and belonged to the Langa nation. When Shah Inayat came of age, the sun of the Mughal Empire was setting swiftly. Next, please. In 1713, Farukh Sayyar ascended the throne after murdering his paternal uncle in the short space of six years, six claimants to the throne were killed and just one died naturally. This tumultuous period is also the period of Sufi Shah Inayat. He was also martyred during the reign of Farukh Sayyar. Next please. At the time when Sufi Shah Inayat began educating and preaching in Jok, uh, this is now where he, his shrine is of the mystic Sufis and Sayyids of Sindh had become purely worldly landlords, forgetting their professional obligations. But Sufi Shah Inayat was not, not one of those traditional Sufis who exhort patience and contentment rather than changing the circumstances and teaching people to accumulate the wherewithal of the hereafter by saying that this worldly life is of limited duration. He was also not one of those religious scholars for whom only an equitable distribution of wealth is the foundation foundation of Muhammadan equality, Masawate Muhammadi. Next, please. Sufi Shah Inayat had decoded the secret of the law of economics that the real thing is the productive process and real equality is that which is established during the productive process rather than the distribution. Otherwise, a band of thieves and looters also can consume by mutual sharing. The reality is that fair distribution of wealth in the productive process is not even possible without equitable participation. So Sufi Shah Inayat emphasized equitable participation in the productive process. Next. It was a belief that the fundamental demand of Muhammadan equality or Masawate Muhammadi is that farming be done on collective principles. Everyone should participate equally in the productive process and should distribute the produce according to, to their need. Sufi Shah Inayat's experiment was very successful. Indeed, the fakirs of Sadat Bulri, who had been devotees of their landlords until now, began to enter the devotional circle of Shah Inayat. Next, please. The popularity of this movement not only lead to the reduction in the number of devotees of the family of Sadat, but the peasants of Babu Paleja and the surrounding areas were also affected. The result was that the peasants of the land began to demand that the method of Sufi Shainayat should also be practiced on their lands. 
but the landlords were not at all prepared to accept the principle of equitable participation in production. They had felt that unless this revolutionary mischief was not dealt with immediately, the feudal and landed system in Sindh would fall in danger. Next, please. Perhaps Farooq Siyar, thinking that Mir Lutf Ali Khan, who was the Subedar or governor of Thatta, was treating the fakirs leniently. So he replaced him in 1716 with Nawab Azam Khan as the Subedar of Thatta. Nawab decided to crush for collective farming and began stoking the flames. He demanded dues from Sufi Shahinayat, which had been forbidden by the sovereign. The Sufi responded by challenging the Nawab's right of collection when these dues had been forgiven from the king. Next, please. He wrote a complaint to the king, insulting his deputies and officials that Sufi Shahinayat and his Fakis were claimants to the throne and refusing to follow the orders of the Khalifatul Allah. Farooq Siyar, without investigating this incidental matter, ordered the rebels to be forced to obey at the point of the sword. Eventually, when even after an initial royal assault on Jok, followed by a four-month siege, there was no prospect of gaining victory over the fakirs. The enemy resorted to deceit and fraud. Next, please. And here is where the, it becomes very tragic. On January 1, 1718, a proposal of peace was presented before Sufi Shahinayat. Muhammad Khan, son of Mia Khuda Yar Khan Kalhora and Shahadat Baloch, military commanders, placing the Quran in between, promised that the lives and property of the fakirs would not be harmed. Some comrades of Sufi Shahinayat tried to reason with him a lot that these oaths and terms and conditions are tricks of the enemy. Do not fall for them. Do not buy into their deceit and continue with the fighting. But how could the pious Sufi doubt an oath over the Quran? So he accepted the peace proposal. Next, please. The entrance to Jhok was opened and the royal army captured the town without any resistance or bloodshed. Afterwards, Sufi Shahinayat Shaheed was brought with great respect to the tent of Nawab Azam Khan on the pretext of signing the peace deed, but immediately after reaching there, he was arrested and put in handcuffs and chains. Then the fire of royal vengeance reached Chok, and a general massacre of the fakirs began. Their homes were burnt. Next, please. Their assets were looted, and the ramparts of the town were razed. The collective farming of Jok was drowned in blood. Neither the sowers of the seed survived, nor the reapers of the crop. Ladies and gentlemen, in this massacre, 15 to 20,000 fakirs were martyred. And there is absolutely no ag other example of so much barbarity in the Muslim world, with the exception of Karbala. There is absolutely no example, 15 to 20,000 fakirs who were totally innocent, whose only crime was to raise the cry of collective farming. They were massacred in cold blood. And on the betrayal of Mia Yar Muhammad Kalhora, Shah Inayat said the following verse. The oppressor had promised by touching his beard, the beard was just the tail of a dog. When Azim Khan saw that this person is neither afraid of him nor repentant over his actions, and does not plead for a pardon of his life, he ordered for the insolent Sufi to be put in prison. Next, please. Okay. While walking away, Shah Inayat recited this verse, O cup bearer, get, get up, take ten cups, bring dust over the sad days. As aki ut jam ka piala bhar ke de, ghame ayam ke sar par matti dal. On January 7, 1718, the 15th of Safar, 11.30 Hijra, Sufi Shah Inayat was beheaded by the order of Sufi Subedar Azam Khan. In the last moments, he was reciting the following verse. It is said that the executioner could not bring about to execute uh, the Sufi. So he gave him some gold coins and said, this is your reward for executing me. Go ahead and kill me. You have released me from the chain of existence. May Allah bless you now and, and, and in the hereafter. So he was basically blessing his executioner. Sufi Shah Inayat was martyred. Next, please. Innumerable fakirs were put to the sword and the town of Jhok was destroyed. But such was the state of fear and despair of the ruling elite that they trembled at the very name of the fakirs. Therefore, Azam Khan had a proclamation made that if anyone let out the word Allah, which is the Ismet Takbir, 
out loud he would be beheaded. Even the name, reciting the name of Allah, ladies and gentlemen, was made capable of, at the point of death. It's, they were so much scared of this, 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 this Sufi Shahinayat. But there is no doubt that Sufi Shahinayat kept firm on his principle of life. Not even for a moment was there a stumble in his steadiness of feet. Next, please. Three centuries after the Sufi's execution, there is no Kalhola, Talpur, or Mughal ever seen in Sindhi politics. Neither were the muftis of Thatta, whose fatwas had supported the rulers, or the peers who had worked against this peasant movement. On the other hand, the ideology of Sufi Shah and Ayat is to be found from Russia to Chile, and from eastern Germany to the West Bengal and Kerala. The ideas of social justice and radical democracy live on in the 21st century. In addition, the Sufi held his humanist ideology dearer than his own life or the lives of his brother, nephew, and fellow fakirs. Before Sufi Shahnaz was executed, his brother and nephew were executed in front of him, but he did not relent. Next, please. Sufi Shahnaz had tried to bring collective farming, meaning socialist mode of production and mode of distribution in the era of feudalism. However, much worthy of admiration and praise this step of his may be, and worthy of respect the sacrifices of his comrades. Nobody has authority over the law of social evolution. This is a cruel reality of our times. His dream was very fortunate, but he was dreaming about it at least two centuries in advance. When to make this dream a reality, neither the material conditions were present, nor the objective conditions were suitable. Next, please. Neither the productive forces had progressed so much that the end of feudalism became inevitable nor a consciousness of their historic character was created among the workers whose task it is to bring the socialist revolution. And even now this consciousness is not there in Sindh. The working class of the 18th century in Sindh could not even think that political power should be seized from the Nawabs and landlords to achieve power for themselves. The people of Jhok did not even reflect on capturing Thatta. What to talk about capturing Sindh? In this situation, the experiment of Sufi Shahinayat necessarily had to fail, and so it did, albeit due to the deceptions of external powers rather than internal weaknesses. Next, please. He also did not have the ability to lead an armed struggle of the people. The movement of Sufi Shahinayat is probably the longest running peasant struggle in the history of, 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 of humanity. Uh, for example, when the Fakirs advised that the army of the Nawab should be attacked on its way by going forward so that the enemy would not get an opportunity to line up and surround Jok, Sufi Shahinayat refused forestalling and made do with just defensive contest. That is how the fighting was decided even before fighting broke out, because defensive war is generally a preamble to defeat. By besieging themselves, they gave a free hand to the enemy and broke their connection with the people of Sindh. Next, please. This is the reason that the peasants of Sindh could not own the selfless struggle of the fakirs as their own struggle. The result was that the fakirs of Jhok had to fight this war alone. No supporter or helper of theirs was created in Sindh, and this war of the fakirs could not assume greater importance than a momentary and local accident. Next, please. This is my last slide. Whatever this trial, but is it any less of a historic feat that by undertaking the first successful experiment of collective farming, Sufi Shah and Ayat Shaheed proved that if landowners and landlords do not intervene, farming can be done with more good style and feelings of affinity and mutual assistance rather than rivalry and enmity. And it is also clear that the oppressive power of the state, until now, has always supported the interest of the upper classes against the people. Alas, that the mention of the invasions of Muhammad bin Qasim, Mahmud Ghaznavi, Nadir Shah, and Ahmad Shah Abdali is made with great emphasis in history textbooks. They were all invaders who came from outside Sindh. But our new generations are not even aware of the name of Sufi Shah and Shahid who actually sprang from, from this very soil. In the end, I would like to quote this poem uh, from Sajid Sarshari. Uh, about, he, he talks about uh, what happened in Jhok. Khushbu jisne ki hai mehkaya sajid pure sindh ko Khushbu jiski ne hai mehkaya sajid pure sindh ko Hai wo gul dasta gul ka gule tar jhok me And on this poetic note I would like to thank you very much for your attention Thank you very much uh, Raza 
And I would now uh, ask our second speaker, uh, Dr. Humera, to present her paper. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to address this particular audience and to be able to speak on Medina. To speak about Islam or Medina is really difficult, especially in a capitalism compliant world, in a capitalism compliant economy, in a capitalism compliant intelligentsia, and a capitalism compliant media. And I say this with authority because I've been part of the policy world, I've been part of media, and I've been part of the academia. So I know what it is. So before I take you to the journey of Medina, as a Professor Hassan Zaman said, it is sometimes difficult for the people to get out of the rationale and the narratives that we all live in. So, what I request you is to suspend any cerebral activity up in the head and let's open our hearts and let with the cognition of the heart, let's with the basira of the heart see what Medina is. Because Medina comes from the man who is the light of this universe. He's the best, the perfect, and the most wise. So what was Medina? What did he give us in the shape of Medina? What kind of gift is Medina? We keep on talking about return to Medina. It's actually returning to a real economic model. Medina is the template for such a model. Our template is a break away from the capitalist Western template. Medina challenges, challenges the robust economy of banking and fiat money. It also challenges the capitalist, individualistic values and the ethics of the West. On the other hand, we have something new called Islamic economics, which is a more religious extension of the Western capitalist model. And the reason that we don't want to question is because we need moral courage. Only if we have moral courage of moving out of our colonial inf inferiority complex and the obsession with adapting to and copying the West, we may be able to recognize Medina. Removing the Western lens of prejudice would make us see what Medina is. Medina is public markets, not supermarkets. Medina is gold, dollar, and silver dinner, not promissory notes. Medina is caravan traders instead of shopkeepers. Medina is killed instead of banking. While well, British exalted individual under the Adam Smith's motto of greed is God, the economy of Medina empowered the community while recognizing the individual. It's about fair play that stands over profit. The economy of Medina was essentially a trading economy. Capitalism, on the other hand, is a financial economy, a debt-based economy. In capitalism, every money is debt, even money is debt, a false promise note. It is a system of debt encompassing all business and all governments. The role of debt in Medina is minimal. Money is a commodity and debt is dis discouraged. There is no possibility of national debt in the economy of Medina. This absurd notion of national debt has nothing to do with Medina. It's a Western tool of economic colonization. The model of Medina is based on caravan cities and public markets. And let me tell you what public markets are. They are not malls, they are not shops. It is an open trading place, first come, first serve. It was publicly owned or was owned by a workers. Like the mosque, it cannot be privatized. Market granted a right to trade to every 
every citizen, big or small, it was based on equal opportunity, fair and fair play. In capitalism, the market price disappears in favor of privately owned shops, malls, and supermarkets. In practice, the model of Medina is based on games, that is, professional organization that share both key assets and liabilities, which means social credit. The competition and collaboration between the professionals is balanced. This is very different from the world that we live in today. In capitalism, the mode of production is well honored with 1,000 employees, which is actually the model of the East India Company, the factory system. When Hindustan and China were the richest countries in the world before East India Company destroyed us, they were based on games or barabaris. I'm sure you have an attachment with the word barabaris. The robberies were based on crafts and not costs. It is after the British Raj when they destroyed the games that the cost was associated primarily with costs. All pre capitalist societies, including all Islamic societies since Medina, were based on games, the robberies. Games and the regulations became forbidden under British law in occupied Hindustan and occupied Egypt. Before the British guilds were the most powerful institution, autonomous in decision making, and backbone of the economy. Our present barabari system is more a relic of it. Original barabaris represented solidarity, brotherhood, which is opposite of the capitalist system, which is based on shareholders' profits and are based on monopoly and wage slavery of the masses. So, what is Medina? Markets, caravans, games, banal, barons, carrot, shirkat, zakat, wakaf. This is Medina. Medina represented the end of three evils, which are rubber, unjust taxation, and monopoly. If Medina is a template for new Pakistan, can Medina te teach us about business models? Is there a Medina business model? The answer is yes and yes. The Medina model is the caravan model. The caravan is a guild of traders. The model lasted for hundreds of years among the Andalusians, Ottomans, and Mughals. Can this model be viable in Pakistan today? Of course. Can this model benefit our Pakistans instead of just few? Yes. But before we look into the details, let us solve the underlying puzzle. Why you have not been able to see the model of Medina before? And what is the paradigm shift? So let me give you an example of two paradigm shifts. Number one, Microsoft. When Microsoft launched in Qatar in 1993, most people predicted with such a capitalist giant behind it that the success of the largest in human history would be inevitable. Yet, from small but the free and the user-generated Wikipedia, can now become larger than Encarta by 2001. By 2009, when Encarta announced its closure, despite its 62,000 articles, the English Wikipedia had already exceeded 3.1 million articles. The giant was defeated. The other example is Uber, a peer-to-peer -peer word sharing. Its, its triumph was as overwhelming as Wikipedia's. The impact in business modeling was so great that people started to talk about uberization concepts such as autonomy, development decision making, and infrastructure sharing became commonplace in business science. This was a paradigm shift. Now we look back at the caravan model. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was a caravan trader, not just a trader. A caravan was a fraternity of traders, like the original craft-based bravery. Members shared resources and commonly owned as a workoff on the basis of everything is a service. Members trusted and watched for each other, which led to the new groundbreaking conception of credit worthiness based on their socially recognized integrity. The caravan 
Alliance was based on solidarity but balanced with the UB competition as individual traders. By comparison, a capitalist economy export company typically would consist of an owner and several head of employees. The employees do their own jobs and decisions are centralized in the management. The management chooses what to buy and what to sell. If this model had 